Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, we have an enormous queue. <laughs> I, uh, this might be a record, so I really encourage you to please, I beseech you to please keep your questions as short as you can. Uh, Larry. Yeah, so we'll... Oh, it'll be Larry, Laurie, and Mike Rappaport for the first trio. <laughs> so, so, well, I, as you know, I'm, I'm in general agreement with, with the paper and with the approach. I think what I'd like to see, because I think this would make the paper a lot stronger, is to do a, 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 a lengthy section on if, if I'm wrong, what is the rule of recognition and, and, is it, and, and what role does the, it, it, does the constitutional text play in that? For example, I, I think the Bobbitt, you know, un, unweighted, unlexically ordered factors is, is incoherent. And um, if the text plays a role, but it's being interpreted by something other than by reference to its original meaning, exactly what would that be? Um, you know, the, the text as, as, as if it were written by someone, by Justice Stevens or something like that. Um, and um, so what I, what I would think you would want to do is to trot out the best opposing arguments, you know, the best arguments about why, you know, what is our practice other than the original meaning of the text? What role does the text play, um, if any, leave, leaving, leaving out precedent, which is kind of a, a you know, a, a side, because there are a lot of cases where there's no precedent. And so the, the um, it would be interesting to see uh, what the alternative view or what alternative views would look like and whether they can stand up. Because one way to, to support the original meaning as the key is to show that there's no other contender that's either coherent or, or um, you know, consistent with anything that's, that's our practice. Right, so, so when we're taking this positive <clears throat> turn, we can certainly say with a lot of empirical support that our law is what the Supreme Court says. Right? And we can notice the Supreme Court's got this practice of claiming to follow the Constitution. Maybe if it stopped that practice and uh, just said that it was not trying to follow the Constitution, maybe we would shift our practices and its words would cease to be our law. But that's speculative. We don't know that. Right? What we know from the empirical evidence is that if the court continues to claim uh, to be seeking the meaning of the Constitution and to be applying it, we will mostly actually seek the meaning of the court's words and will actually conform our behavior to them, right? And when we look at our practices as, as citizens, it would be very odd to say that there's nothing that following instructions just is, right? I mean, the Supreme Court's very good at slapping us down when we don't follow their instructions, right? See, Cooper B. Aaron. So rather than saying that an originalist approach to constitutional meaning is our law, couldn't we more accurately focus in and say an originalist approach to the Supreme Court's words is clearly our law. Uh, you know, they clearly constitute for us the, the, the nature of law in our society, and maybe their status as law depends on the courts continuing to claim that it is following the Constitution, though that's far from certain. Okay, so, so two points. First, really quick, uh, I wonder about the characterization of Brown as inclusive originalism. Even if you accept that they said it was ambiguous, wouldn't you then look to precedent and practice, which would cut the other way? Um, so, but the, the, the main question I have is, so you say at one point, you know, if there were, judges were involved in a kind of Illuminati conspiracy, would we really say that that was the law? And maybe we wouldn't, um, but I'm not sure we could say there was a law at that, you know, we would really have a very problematic situation with respect to law. And I, I'm not necessarily saying this is the case, but, but let's take, a, I think, a plausible possibility, which is that there, there's a kind of non-originalist conspiracy, except it's not secret, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? So, so we know that you know, large numbers of judges, certainly you know, likely a majority of the Supreme Court, um, does not think of themselves as, as, as originalists. Um, they go about deciding cases in a kind of non-originalist way, um, not even a kind of. Um, so, so it's sort of interesting, Justice Kagan, you, you quote um, her statement, I, I'm, I'm told she just went to a law school and was asked to sort of follow up about that, you know, she said, no, I'm not an originalist. So I, I don't know how to <laughs> characterize that, maybe she, admit, she meant not an exclusive originalist, um, but I'm thinking not. 
Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, one characterization of the practice is there's a lot of non-originalists out there. The motivations are non-originalists. They know there's a constraint, um, but there's almost always you can decide these cases based on precedent, um, or you can decide them by silence and not addressing the ultimate um, methodological situations. And every once in a while, there's an old canon case that comes up where there isn't a precedent, and so you stretch a little bit, and suddenly it's ambiguous. So, um, you know, if that if that may not be the right account of the practice, but if that is the practice, what would you say with respect to um, uh, the claim about the law? Uh, yes, these are all great questions, of course. Um, so. Not quite in order. Keeping with the rule of three, I'm going to combine them all into, I think, several things they're driving at. Uh, <clears throat> on the one possibility of should I go through all of the, you know, the most plausible contenders for what else could be the, the rule of recognition, uh, maybe this is, maybe this is uh, madness. But my hope was to sort of flush out, the, flush out the arguments by writing this provocative paper and cause people to themselves put forward for whatever they think is the best arguments so that then they can be, be shot down once they're in the open. Uh, I worry that if I do it, I'll be accused of, of erecting straw men. Um, not so sure that the follow the Supreme Court is the best way to think of our, our, pract our legal rule or that it's inconsistent with originalism. So of course, not a coincidence that the body is the Supreme Court, which is a constitutionally created body whose membership is entirely determined by a set of procedures set in the constitutional text. Uh, and in any event, the fact that, that people regularly, everybody thinks the Supreme Court gets things wrong, suggests that there's some reference to some other set of norms that aren't just what the Supreme Court says. Um, I think the, the problem, the Illuminati problem, uh, is a much bigger problem than I make it out to be. Uh, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a big problem. I think it's really interesting. I, I'd love to know whether I'm right or wrong about the way to think about it. Uh, I think I'm right, obviously. But um, so one possibility, and I think it's a serious possibility, is that, is that we actually have no law. Uh, there is no consensus in some deep way. And we have some just not even pluralism, really, because I don't think there's agreement on that, but just some sort of deep set of, deep set of madness. Um, or, or interpretive contestation. Uh, and I actually agree with Matt that it would be a mistake as a sort of positivist matter to try to, try to turn something into law if it's, if it's not. So I, I think that's, a, that's a one serious contender uh, for an alternative, alternative view. Uh, I don't think that's right, but I'd, I'd love to see somebody try to make that case. Um, yeah. Uh, one, and I guess one reason I'm not totally sure it's right, even though you might think it is, is, is there's a sort of question about how to think about like hardcore legal realism in here. So if you just took all the Supreme Court cases ever and sort of coded them and try, you know, what are their outcomes and like what are the inputs to predict when the court is going to do things, right? I think it's true you would see patterns that are not always the same as the explicit reasoning of the opinions. There are secret practices, there are silent practices, there are versions of... of Things like that. But what you'd see, I think, uh, what it seems like you see is sort of rich people win, poor people lose, in-groups win, out-groups lose, uh, partisan, you know, partisan affiliation is a determinant. And yet nobody in our practice thinks those can be asserted as sort of legal reasons to act or as reasons the judges should act one way or the other. Uh, those seem to be sort of patterns that we think are a, are a regrettable thing that our law fights against. So it seems to me there is some, there's some reason that the, those kinds of, of just sort of sheer patterns and how to just decide is not quite the same thing as the question of what are, what are our rules of legal reasoning. But I welcome more trenchant criticism on that score. Let, let, me, let me just say, I mean, it's, it, it's perfectly possible to be a textualist and not be an originalist. Right? It's perfectly possible to say, I'm going to read this word, say, liberty, not in light of the original understandings, either in the old time sense of translated, but in light of my own understandings. Now, that might be deeply confused. It might be morally wrong. Most people in this room think it's morally wrong, but it's possible, and many judges do it. So if you're going to identify the content of the rule of recognition with reference to judicial practices, right, and not clean up that morally, you have to recognize that as a possibility. If you want to say, no, our rule of recognition is not then, then in effect, you're being a kind of a natural lawyer. And that's fine, but understand your jurisprudential commitments. Uh, next up is Chris Green, Ian Bartram, and Tom Colby. Uh, so uh, I love lots of things about this. I love the idea. It's kind of a, a 
relatively short normative tail and a big sociological dog. I think the normative tail needs to be a little bit bigger, uh, and it's uh, uh, because uh, you need a principle for separating the wheat from the chaff uh, when you've got conflict. This is really clear in state constitutional law because uh, you go and you can find, I mean, in Mississippi, and I'm sure in lots of other states, there are just they say they're originalist one day, and they say they're not originalist, you know, not the next day, but you know, the next year, and then they'll cite them both. I mean, it just, there's, there is a lot of incoherence. Is it just incoherence working itself pure uh, that, that, that kind of is, is, is supposed to, to get us out of that? Or is there some kind of foundation like the nature of the Constitution as embodied in the Article VI oath to obey this Constitution? Uh, so, you know, I've, I've pressed that. And so that's you know where you know, the ethics of the oath, I think, is, is where you where you need. That's that's the addition to the to the normative tale. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of, uh, details about McDonald. Uh, first, uh, Stevens has all this stuff about Palco, but that's not about the original. That's not his constitutional theory. He's got this sentence. He says the uh, original meaning of the privileges or immunities clause is not nearly clear enough to overrule Slaughterhouse. Seems like the. The coin of the realm for Stevens in his dissent is clarity of original meaning. On the other hand, Alito, for, in the majority opinion, when he's talking about guns and how, how they're unsafe, he says these are contested pol uh, uh, policy judgments, which seems to suggest he does feel at least some kind of uh, uh, obligation to, uh, to fight it to a draw. If you had studies about how a constitutional right is not going to kill us, it seems like you should cite them. Uh, uh, Noel Canning, uh, 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 one thing that really disturbed me about all the justices is that they all cite Frankfurter's concurrence in Youngstown favorably, which is you know, this glossy constitution, uh, very common law constitution. I'm like, holy cow, what, Scalia, what is up with you? And I, it, just, it, it seems like there's incoherence there. Uh, 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 you know, he said, oh, well, all I mean is later traditions, but that's not what Frankfurter said. He says that later practice is a gloss on the Constitution, uh, uh, which is deserving of, of obligations. So I'll, I'll stop at that point. Yeah, so, so I think the paper is, is great. Um, coincides with a lot of what I want to see. And I, and, uh, and I think if you can make the descriptive claim, I think you've basically won, I guess, is the... Uh, I think if you actually can, can succeed in that, then I think originalism wins, right? So, uh, so, so good on that. My question is about the anti-originalist cases. I have sort of two thoughts about your use of those. Uh, the first one is, um, I think there's a difference, and I know there's a difference, right, between demonstrating that something is, that anti-originalism is not the law, right, and demonstrating that originalism is the law. And so, I, you know, I'm not sure how much payoff you get from claiming that there's not a behavioral regularity of being anti-originalist. I, I think we need to see a behavioral regularity of, of originalism trumping on a regular basis, right? Um, second, uh, I wonder if you know, with, though you do an admirable job of sort of bringing them on board the originalist inclusive ship, I wonder if the, the, the price is too great, right, of being that inclusive. In other words, that, that uh, I, you know, it, it, at least to the degree, the degree that like sort of the original protagonists of originalism were reacting precisely against those sorts of cases, right, and that exactly was the claim of originalism, that you're, you're departing from the law, right, uh, and you're making the law up, right. Uh, do, do those claims get defeated if these things become uh, the law has the has the cost been too great to to be this inclusive? Um, okay, well, a comment and then a question that flows from that comment, sort of agreeing in a sense with with Ian. So here's the comment. The comment is, uh, I welcome this paper. Uh, it seems to me to reject those strict forms of originalism that condemn the modern liberal decisions of the Supreme Court. It ultimately seems to conclude that the proper form of originalism, the only originalism that is law is the type of flexible, open-ended, inclusive, second-order originalism that recognizes that the most important and contentious provisions in the Constitution were drafted in objectively broad and flexible terms, the type of originalism that can justify cases like Griswold and Lawrence and Casey and the impending gay marriage decision. In other words, the paper seems to me to defend the type of originalism that has been concerning to Steve Smith lately, and the type of originalism that Justice Kagan had in mind when she said we are all originalists now. So if that's the positive turn, if that's what originalism has now become, then sign me up. Um, but here's the question, and it goes to the last part of your initial remarks today, which is sort of what, what is the point here? 
are you arguing only descriptively that flexible orig originalism is our law, whereas a stricter form of originalism or blatant non-originalism are not? Or are you arguing normatively? And if there is a normative argument here, does it imply that because they are not our law, not only non-originalism, but also strict originalism are in some meaningful sense illegitimate or impermissible or lawless? Um, yeah, thank you. So actually, first on the, the question of textualism but not originalism, that would be another great competitor for a possible, possible rule of recognition. It is possible that the constitutional text in non-originalist fashion is our, is our real rule. Um, uh, one reason to think not is that the court does seem to at least resist what seem to be obvious puns. Like, it doesn't, nobody thinks that the domestic violence clause of the Constitution applies to what we now know as domestic violence. Uh, in fact, people think that would be silly. Uh, and, and presumably that's, that's because there's some sort of latent originalism going on. Or similarly, uh, members of what became the majority opinion in Noel Canning criticized the Solicitor General for trying to repurpose the recess appointments clause from one thing to another, taking a clause, as they, as they said, that was designed to deal with senatorial absence and use it to deal with senatorial intransigence. Uh, and there was a widespread sense that it was some, some sort of mistake to think that the recess appointments clause, you, know, you should use it to deal with the filibuster when that wasn't the original problem it addressed. But I agree that's, a, that's another competing view, and, and it's hard sometimes to tease these two apart. Uh, on the size of the normative tale, uh, I guess I thought I could get away with citing some great scholarship by these guys, Chris Green and Richard Ray, on the normative power of the oath and not have to sort of make those arguments myself. Uh, or, you know. <laughs> but maybe, yeah, maybe, that, maybe they need sort of a, a gold border or something um, uh, to sort of fully take advantage of that. Uh, on the sort of related questions about like the price, is this, is this gonna give up what made the old originalism so attractive and sign up all the people like, like Tom Colby? I, I mean, maybe, uh, I guess, I do think that the, uh, to quote Steve Sachs, the old originalism was abandoned for a reason, uh, which is that it was wrong. Um, and so I guess I'm not that troubled by it ultimately, uh, although I, th I want to trouble some people. I think it's right that, it, that if, uh, the things that seem most attractive about originalism are the older and stricter version of originalism. This positive turn should be, should be uh, a threat uh, or should be worrisome. Uh, that's not to say that, that there aren't ways to justify the old originalism even in this framework. Again, you could sort of pursue a normative framework or you could say that actually the best understanding of even the inclusive criteria yields a kind of strict originalism. But that, you know, I, I do want it to discomfort. Uh, but at the same time, you know, don't be too quick to sign up here. Uh, I mean... Uh, I feel like we are, we are getting on board a train and, and you know, the doors may be closing. So um, it's not the case that, that everything counts as originalism or that you can make an argument for anything you want to. Uh, you know, those arguments are falsifiable. They're open to historical research. You have to do the work. So it may be a full employment plan for originalist law professors. Um, but but you know, don't think that it will be safe to sign on because surely the materials will always yield, uh, or at least allow one to yield, whatever it is you want to find in them. Uh, and in that sense, I think it's like many other methods of reasoning, like utilitarianism or cost-benefit analysis or what, whatever it is uh, you want. That is, there may be ways to make arguments for both sides of a lot of positions, but some of the arguments will be better than others. And if you start conceding that this is the real criterion we should use to judge these things, uh, you know, it will, it will sometimes produce results uh, you may not want. So, so welcome aboard, but uh, be careful. Let, let, me, I mean, let me just say, if you want to understand Stevens, I mean, Stevens, it seems to me, and I haven't done the full research, but St Stevens, is, uh, his view, his sort of common law constitutionalism is very much the common law constitutionalism of, of, of Harlan and Cardozo. Hit the view of McDonald, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, his article, um, uh, The Bill of Rights, Century of Progress, right, which is probably his fullest sort of scholarly statement of his view, it's a view w w which talks about the common law evolution of the concept of liberty with lots of judicial refinements. I mean, so I don't, you know, I, I think the view is clearly non original So let me say this about Stevens. I mean, there are three ways to handle him. One is to say it's just an aberration, right? He's morally confused or something like that. But that's the move that the positivists can't make. The second is to sort of expand the concept of originalism so that what Stevens, you know, is doing in McDonald's 
um, and throughout his 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 his, 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 his you know career as a judge is originalist, and that's fine. So if originalism means everything, uh, then you know fine. But it's not a useful concept. The third is to say, is to concede that in a first order sense, what Stevens is doing, and not insincerely, it's not an Illuminati thing. He's transparent about this, right? That he wants to look at the evolution of the law and perhaps have the judge to add her own views, you know, substantial goes to that. That nonetheless, this is in some deeper sense originalist, and that indeed I think is the move that Will is, you know, trying to take, and I applaud that. Uh, 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 but let's concede that there are people out there, we may not like them, you might not want them on the court and so forth, who in a you know, very transparent way are saying, I'm not looking to the original meaning of these words, or I'm putting my own spin in it, or, or something like that. Okay. Uh, the next three questions are from Christina Mulligan, uh, Randy Kozel, and then a very short one from me. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, when I got to the section on foreign constitutions, I started wondering how it was possible to get a non-originalist constitution without being originalist. So the, the Canadian constitution, it's originalist to be not originalist because it says right in it that the law is a living tree. Um, in other cases, when you're talking about France, there's a break at some point where they say we're, we're now going to view the preamble as the law, but that sounds to me like if, if that's all you need to be a non-originalist constitution, then if a couple Supreme Court cases happen to explicitly say, now we're not going to be originalist, it, it almost sounds like then, in fact, we would not be. Um, and I don't think that's, that's normatively where you want to go, but it, I'm curious how you get a constitution that is not originalist in any other way. And so maybe this is just echoing Chris Green's question about how do we know when enough people think it's not originalist to be not originalist? Um, the one way I think you could get out of this is if you've, you've always been non-originalist, even though the Constitution didn't say so, but it, it's possibly hard to find examples of that, given that at the very beginning, presumably the people making the laws have the same impressions they had when they wrote the, when they wrote the Constitution. Randy? Thanks. Uh, well, I, I think it's a wonderful paper, a wonderful project. So I have a, a narrow question about how you handle one part of the argument uh, that I was hoping you could explain in a little greater detail. It has to do with the degree of generality for understanding precedent and stare decisis. And you talk about Casey briefly, and I think that's a good example. So the majority in Casey certainly applies something that they call stare decisis. And that's a principle that's been with us for centuries. But in deriving the content of that doctrine, they don't seem to care a whit about the original understanding or reconstruction. They don't say Madison gave us a series of prudential and pragmatic considerations, right? They say we've sort of developed them. And so given how focused your project is on what the justices say and what they purport to be doing, I wonder why that same approach wouldn't say, uh, well, they don't purport to be particularly concerned with following uh, an original understanding of precedent, and therefore Casey's non-originalist. And I gather you have, a, you have a footnote where you say, well, I think there's an important distinction between substance and authority, uh, and I'd be interested to hear more about that, uh, exactly what you're getting at. And then I guess the, the point that flows out of it, which in some ways follows uh, Christina's question, I think, is what if Casey just weren't originalist? Or what if an opinion comes down the pike in a few months that is expressly anti-originalist? I gather you don't you know, take a match to your paper and say it was fun while it lasted, right? You, you don't, I don't think you need to bat a thousand, do you, for your theory to stand up. You can have a few outliers. Now, maybe as a descriptive matter, it is a clean sweep. Uh, but I guess how much dissonance could you tolerate? And can't, can't we have an originalist constitutional order and have some decisions that are wrong, even if they're not just wrong in applying originalism? My question follows directly on that, because I was thinking, look, looking at your paper, it seems that you have, you, you permit a lot of, I don't know, understand baseball, but not batting a thousands. Like, you have a lot of, inter, you, have, you permit interregnums, you permit lying Supreme Court justices who are actually unoriginal, unoriginalists but are pretending to be originalists. You permit sort, sort of kabuki originalism, you permit dissents. Um, all of that's within the scope of your descriptive theory, so it doesn't seem to me to be very easy to falsify. And so that, to me, seems, you know, when I think about making descriptive theory, I think, oh, it, you know, it ought to be falsifiable. But on the other hand, is it a strength of the theory that it's not easy to falsify? <laughs> I think of falsifiability as being desirable, but maybe its absence just means you have a very good theory. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, so I think... Two slightly different questions. One is what, count, what counts as falsification evidence, and the other is how much of it do you need to falsify, sort of burden of proof and type. So I do think decisions like uh, 
probably like the, the French constitutional court decision, although I'm still sort of immersed in, in an internal understanding of that, and probably like Israeli constitutional law, qualify as falsifications. That is, when the court is openly indifferent or, or even hostile to the original meaning of some scope, uh, gives it force it wasn't supposed to have. That's, that's an example of the, of the kind of counterexample. Or if, or if you know, Eric Posner wrote Supreme Court Opinions, uh, the way he writes books. Like those would all, those, those count as kind of, of potential contrary evidence. Um, that's, that, that, then a lot of the other questions go more to, well, is one enough? You know, if, if we find one sort of opinion that says, you know, we read this interesting working paper, uh, is originals of our law, we just want to all make clear it's not, uh, and they move on. Yeah, d does the paper get burned up? Uh, there, I'm not so sure, and, and I will say, so I think it's important that I not be agnostic about what kinds of evidence falsify the theory. I'm not quite sure I'm committed to having a view about the burden of proof. Uh, I'd kind of like to say, I mean, I think there are, because I think there are different ways you could think about that in part based on those various jurisprudential theories we tried to get past. Since we're all talking about sports we don't understand, uh, Hart has a section about this, actually, that, that uh, where he uses both cricket and baseball, uh, and where he says, you know, the fact that some rulings given by a scorer are plainly wrong is not inconsistent with the game continuing. They count as much as rulings which are obviously correct. But there's a limit to the tolerance of incorrect decisions that are compatible with the continued existence of the game. And the question of what happens is sort of the scoring rule is totally repudiated. So there are some questions built in about is it enough for the court just to say it? Uh, I think the reaction would also matter. So if the court said once, we're not going to be originalist, but everybody else in the legal system said, whoa, you know, that's like not the way we normally do things. Don't do that again. Maybe we'll let you get away with it this time. We won't impeach you or whatever it is. That, that would be maybe a sign of the strength of the continued rule. Uh, the more it happens and the more uneventfully it happens, the more it's a sign of the, of the weakness of the rule. I don't have an answer to how many of those it takes or, or anything like that. Uh, and I think that's sort of, I'm not sure we're, I'm not sure we're advanced enough to even, to even get there. Uh, one thing about precedent, uh, Randy, of course, spots the place where I tried to smooth over a lot of hard questions about how to think about the original meaning of precedent. But just quickly, um, you know, precedent is complicated because it's a sort of, I think, it's a sort of common law doctrine that the Constitution tolerates but does not directly tell you very much about how it works. And so what it is to be an originalist about precedent is itself complicated. You might say, because it's a common law doctrine and nobody else has the power to change it, pre the only rules of precedent that can survive are the original rules of precedent. And we've got to dig into stuff people in this room have written about how precedent used to work. You might say that because it's a common law doctrine, it's actually OK for it to change in certain ways. Uh, and therefore, the modern doctrine of precedent, as long as it's sort of you know, the modern doctrine of precedent could itself be permissible. Uh, I'm working on trying to figure out how to think about all those questions and what the right answer is, uh, and I'm not currently committed to a view, which is part of why I don't get into it as much as I should. Let me just say, on, on, on the burden of proof, I mean, if you're Hardian, the burden of proof is preponderance. I mean, for Hart, law is a social fact. It's, it, it, it's just a question of preponderance of the evidence, right, what the social facts are. Can a non-originalist be wrong? I mean, that depends crucially on whether the legal status of originalism is, number one, by virtue of being part of the rule of recognition, or number two, by, by virtue of derivation. These are the two possibilities for Hart. If the claim is that originalism is legally binding by virtue of being part of the rule of recognition, then non-originalists, or at least non-originalist officials, at least if there are enough of them, can't be wrong. They just change the rule of recognition. Right? Now, again, if, you know, if they're a small group and then you know, the rest of officials react and they say, no, we don't mean it, then maybe the rule is really originalist. But if a large group of officials persistently say, no, we're not originalists, then originalism is not part of the rule of recognition. Either non-originalism is or the, or, or the rule of recognition is just divergent. If, on the other hand, the claim is that originalism is legally valid by virtue of derivation, then, of course, non-originalists can be wrong. Right? If the rule of recognition is, you know, by hypothesis, Choose the interpretive method which you know, is truest to the, to, to, to the nature of law and is best for democracy. And if you believe that that's originalism, then a non-originalist can be wrong. So the point is just be clear about the underlying conception of law and about how that's being used to argue for originalism. And don't, I'm not saying you're doing this, but, 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 but again, it, it might seem that by being positivist and, by, 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 and by, by saying that originalism has positivist warrant by being part of the rule of recognition, you're making the case for originalism easy. No, you're not. What you're doing thereby is empowering dissenters, right? If that's the claim, then if there are enough Stevens, originalism is not the law. Uh, Robert Bennett, uh, James Ely, and Caleb Nelson are our next three. Well, uh, quite apart from the possibility there's a difference between um, 
textualism and originalism. Uh, it's pretty clear in Will's uh, remarks and paper that the text is supposed to be um, very strong part of originalism. But I would say it's not at all uh, difficult to find uh, instances where the text isn't taken uh, very seriously at all. And this quite apart from the problems of vagueness and uh, ambiguity. Uh, one in the judicial context is uh, Scalia uh, singing the praises of uh, initiatives and referenda because of their democratic credentials, paying no attention whatsoever to the what the hell it means to be a Republican uh, form of government. Um, and then outside of the uh, judicial context, uh, it's also very easy to find uh, places where the text isn't uh, taken terribly uh, seriously. The so-called Saxby fix, uh, uh, which in pretty damn claim, uh, plain language would have made uh, Hillary Clinton ineligible to be Secretary of State, uh, is paid no attention to it all. Not no attention, she had to take a lower salary, uh, but uh, uh, that uh, wasn't uh, following the language. Um, uh, a, uh, a second uh, example, under the pressure of the Civil War, uh, Lincoln, and then more recently some originalist scholars uh, find that state consent uh, to the formation of a new state out of an existing state uh, is uh, found by uh, some uh, folks uh, in a little part of the state saying, we're the state, and, uh, and that's just a bizarre uh, reading of uh, that language. Uh, and then the thing I huff and puff about most is the Electoral College. Um, we select the president uh, in a way now that uh, not only is uh, bizarre in the sense of what the people who came up with the constitutional language about the Electoral College were attempting to accomplish, but the most plausible reading of the language would uh, uh, turn our present way of uh, choosing the President of the United States upside down. We couldn't have the names of candidates on the ballots, uh, presidential candidates. We couldn't have the names of political parties on the ballots. We'd have to choose uh, the President in an entirely different way if you just took the language of the Constitution uh, seriously. I'd like to build on a point that Michael raised, I think, a little while ago, uh, and suggest, much as I enjoyed your paper and found it very compelling in many respects, that many of your examples are more like built on, built on sand. Uh, that, in point of fact, uh, some of the cases which you cite as suggesting that they start with the originalist premise really demonstrates that they're paying next to no attention to the original premise at all. And I think you know well where I'm going. Uh, I'm going to the Blaisdell opinion. Now, let's consider your treatment of Blaisdell just for a moment. On two pages, you at least three different times suggest that Blaisdell may, in fact, be wrongly decided on the merits, a point with which, incidentally, I would agree. But, but you shift to tell us that isn't really very important. What's important is the rhetoric, that Chief Justice Hughes begins with the rhetoric of originalism, uh, and that suggests that he, therefore, uh, uh, is ultimately in the, in the originalist camp. It seems to me, however, that his opinion is a real sleight of hand. His originalist language is almost immediately shifted when he purports to find the contract clause vague, and then, he, then of course, he opens the door to an interpretation which is at odds with well, at least 100 years of reading of the contract clause before that point. Uh, in short, if you think actions speak louder than words, uh, it might suggest, to my mind, that Hughes' thing was a lar largely, largely a smokescreen. Now, why did he engage in it at all? He engaged in it, I think, because he had to deal with the rather strenuous dissent by Justice Sutherland, who does take an original approach, and who demonstrates pretty clearly, I think, that the history of the contract clause cuts against the opinion that Hughes is, is trying to render. So overall, and at the end of the day, I'm inclined to think that our Randy Barnett is correct, but this is not an originalist opinion. Uh, I think that Hughes is, in fact, moving away from uh, an originalist reading. And I think it is those scholars, and you quote a number of them here, who suggest that are, are accurate. And, and I think maybe you've tried a little too hard to work Blaisdell in, into your formula. I can't comment on the other cases. This, I'll let it go with this for the moment. But just, just reflect as you 
Reflect on Baysdale as, as you rework this paper. <laughs> Like Randy, I'm thinking about precedent, and like Mila, I'm wondering what counts as falsifying evidence. And in particular, I'm wondering what to make of opinions that apply precedents without talking about the original meaning. It seems to me a judge might have two different rationales for doing that. One is inclusive originalism, right? We really care about whether the original meaning of the Constitution tolerates reliance on precedent in circumstances where we think the precedent is wrong about the original meaning of a specific provision, right? Kind of the, the Bodian inclusive originalism justification for, for following precedent under those circumstances. A second possibility, and I'm sure there are others, but a second possibility is what you contrast with inclusive originalism, Dick Fallon's theory of the authority of precedent as standing apart from originalism. I wonder whether the, if, if we found lots of opinions in which courts just applied the precedents without talking about original meaning, would that be any evidence in favor of Fallon's theory, or is that simply neutral? Does that count as falsifying evidence that they don't bother to say, well, we've looked at the original meaning of the Constitution and we agree that there's this inclusive originalism that permits us to, to do what we're doing in relying on precedent here. Does the fact that they don't explicitly have that step count as evidence against your theory or is it simply neutral? Uh, okay, so two thoughts. So one on uh, Zaxby Fixed, Electoral College, the 14th Amendment, Blaisdell, the whole, the whole lot, right? I guess... I think there is an important difference between asking whether or not a constitutional decision uh, in the courts or out of the courts looks to the original meaning as the criterion it has to satisfy and whether it satisfies those criterion correctly as we in our wisdom know today. And for that reason, I worry that even phrases like originalist opinion are sort of, they're vague about that important thing and, and I don't, you know... I think, I think, yeah, they're vague and, and I could be misinterpreted to say that all of these opinions that, you know, correctly look to original meaning as the criterion also get that criterion correct. And I think this is most easily seen in the case of statutory interpretation where there's widespread agreement, for example, that uh, the text of the statute and congressional intent in some combination are the criterion of decision. And yet, of course, there's lots of contestation of whether they're right or wrong. But, but mostly we don't. We don't take say, oh, here's a sort of stupid reading of the text, and that proves we're not textualists. But anyway, so I guess, and I'll say, I, I mean, so I'm, I'm going to pass up the bait uh, to go into this, although I like to talk about more. I think the Zaxby fix is fine as a textual matter. I think that the 14th Amendment was probably done right as a textual matter. I don't think I'm troubled by the Electoral College either, although it's a little more complicated. So, uh, and I'm not going to argue with, uh, about Blaisdell. Um, but so that's, that's another reason that the sort of results are all complicated. On the, the precedent thing, so I think the answer is that a decision that relies on precedent without talking about original meaning either way doesn't, it, it is neither here nor there as between originalism, precedent, and pluralism uh, as methods of interpretation. Um, I think it's sort of consistent with both, and, and so I'm not inclined, I'm sort of inclined to see those sort of drop out of the question there. And I guess you see this in a lot of different places with different questions. So opinions that rely on the a lot on the text, you might see as being sort of neither here nor there as between non-originalist textualism and originalism. Opinions that rely on the precedent are indifferent as between precedent and my form of originalism and so on. So there are a lot of sort of pairwise decisions that could be squared with any two theories. And part of what I'm saying is that my theory is the one that best sort of, it comes out in all those cases. Uh, it can explain the precedent cases, it can explain the text cases, it can explain the traditional originalism cases, sort of all, all together. Uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's right, uh, but if there's some reason that shouldn't be right, uh, I'd like to know about that, too. Uh, oh, finally, I should say, I don't think that actions speak louder than words. I think courts uh, act through words, uh, law is about legal reasoning and words. So I guess I think, I mean, the premise of the paper is that in some sense words speak louder than actions. Um, Randy Barnett, uh, Stephen Sachs, and Larry Solomon. Uh, boy, it's tough to get into humans. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, as a, someone who uh, likes natural law and natural rights, I just think it's just so funny to hear the positivists who think this is like the most predictable, uh, ascertainable thing, debate amongst themselves about what the positive law is, what it can be, what the criteria of it is. It sounds every bit as uncertain to me 
as anything I hear in, on the natural law side. Anyway, that's just an aside. But I, have, I do, I do, I do, I do uh, have a question. This is, this is more of a thing for math than it is for Will. I mean, if, this, if and I don't claim to be an expert on the rule of recognition, but if the rule of le recognition is a grunt norm, if it's a basic norm, you, I, I, was saying, I had social norm, you had social practice. I forgot what you said, but the Constitution isn't an ordinary law. I mean, everything everybody's saying about, well, if the Supreme, if you say if enough Supreme Court justices do this long enough, then that's the law. But the Constitution is not the law that governs us. The Constitution is the law that governs them. They don't get to change the law any more than we get to change the law by disobeying it. We, go, we can't change the speed limit just by speeding. So that doesn't change the law. They have to change the law properly, and just disobeying it is not evidence that it isn't the law. So when would you see the Grund norm manifested? It wouldn't be manifested necessarily. I could... I can understand why a long uh, period of acquiescence could be considered evidence of the Grund norm. But in fact, the, there's been a war on originalism for 100 years. The progressives didn't like the Constitution. They didn't like the original meaning of the Constitution. And most legal academics think the progressives won. But I don't think they did. That's what the whole Mies originalism revival was about. It was, a, it was, a, it was the Grund norm striking back. Otherwise, what were they hooking onto when they started invoking um, uh, originalism again? And then it had all this political traction. Where's the political traction coming from if the progressives won, if the left uh, side of academia has already won and declared victory and gone home? So therefore, if it's really the Grund norm, where would you see it coming out? Partly it would be in the homage that, vi that vice pays to virtue in these opinions by people who don't believe in it, but it would really come out in confirmation hearings. That's when you'd be expected to see it. What do they say when, the, when C-SPAN cameras are rolling and other, everybody's watching and people in the Senate Judiciary Committee who are not really expert on all this, they're, they're, they're asking questions. That's when you expect, you don't expect to see it behind closed doors or in Supreme Court opinions that no one besides we in the room read. You expect to see it there. And if you don't see it there, if you see somebody like, somebody super smart and knowing, like Justice Kagan, saying what she says, she knows she knows what everybody in this room, she knows the secret. She won't say it out loud. That should tell you something about the positive grunt norm, which comes from the people in a republic. It doesn't come from them. And so that would, I, I think that, uh, which, you want to know what's falsifiable? The next presidential appointment by a Democratic nominee in front of a Democratic Senate. Let's see them actually own up to what progressives and law professors have been saying for 100 years. Then I'd be persuaded that the Grund norm has changed. So, um, three uh, quick points. The first is that I think, uh, as you well know, I, I agree with you that words speak louder than actions in this. I think it would be useful to highlight that. Um, second, uh, with regard to the precedent and sort of pairwise issue, I think that one thing to note is that often judicial opinions don't go down to first principles every time. You'll have a whole statutory opinion that's all about what the statute means, and they don't talk about why the statute's constitutional or where constitutions come from or anything that's further, you know, that's deeper than that. And so the real issue is, are there cases that talk about the nature of precedent and the roots of precedent, and what do they cite? So does Cooper v. Aaron, so, or, you know, are there other things that are tilt against your thesis or not? Or do they claim the sanction of the original Constitution, um, uh, like, uh, which I'm mispronouncing, and it sets off? Or, you know, are, are, there, are those the kinds of claims that are being made? Um, third thing, with regard to the inclusiveness, you have some discussion around page 30 or so about sex discrimination, same-sex marriage, and Gideon. And I wonder whether, in some sense, you might be giving the wrong impression. Because the point, I would think, is not that these cases might be right under an originalist framework, but just that the arguments that are made for them are not themselves inconsistent with originalist argumentation. Because um, the danger is that you make it seem too inclusive, that sort of originalism you know, sort of has no substantive criteria. The real point is to get people like Tom Colby to sign in blood, and then you know, they can't escape later when we present them with all the history and so on. I'll refer to my comment. <laughs> I love that. Great paper, Will. Um, and uh, let me just make three suggestions. So the first suggestion is about theoretical foundations, right? And I think you are uh, now, in this version of the paper, I think you are making a mistake to the extent you allow the paper to be characterized as in the Harshan tradition. The actual method of the paper is 
Patterson-Bobbitt. That is, we are operating within a complex argumentative practice. Your method does not require any external theory of the nature of law, right? It, it, Hart's theory, of course, incorporates the internal point of view, but it's an external theory. And you can bracket the question as to what external theory is correct, right? Uh, at any rate, I, even if you don't adopt this as the official theoretical position of the paper, you might include it as a set of plural theoretical foundations. Uh, uh, for the paper. Two, um, I do not think you are now confronting, now that I've heard the discussion today, I don't think you're confronting the most powerful articulation of a position that is in opposition to your theory, right? I think that that uh, 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 stance will rely on Dworkin's point about theoretical disagreement. Right. So what they are going to say, what the what the sort of the strongest opposition will say is not that there is decisive rejection of originalism. They won't try to prove that. They will attempt to show that there is theoretical disagreement about whether original meaning plays the top of the pyramid role that you suggest it plays. Right. And so uh, their point will be that there is an underdetermination of theory by the data. That's enough to refute your claim, right? So I think you have to take the, you have to take this on directly. Third point is um, uh, the way I put this is a, is a distinction between contribution versus constraint, or in your terminology. Right, is it at the top of the pyramid or is it someplace else? Right, is original meaning at the top of the period? So I think it's very important that you claim a point about contribution. This is Mark Greenberg's terminology, right? It is clear that now, it's absolutely clear that original meaning contributes, right? And in terms of the current argumentative practice, you cannot make the argument that would go, Original meaning, irrelevant, dead hand, right? That, that is not a permissible move within the argumentative practice. It's a mandatory consideration. And then the question would become, for your opponents, what is required to overcome the text? And especially, I think you want to say, what is required to overcome clear text? Right, because it's not when you form, formulate the, the the version of your opponent's claim that it's merely making a contribution. It's going to turn out that the mere contribution is very powerful, because what it takes to overcome clear text, right, is going to be a lot. And so then that narrows the ground between the most plausible alternative view and your view. And, and then, you know, sort of to the extent that you are able to narrow that ground, uh, you're in a much stronger position. Uh, okay. I'm told we're out of time, so I'll do this very fast. Uh, Randy, I think somebody, and it should probably be you, should write an article called The Grund Norm Strikes Back. Uh, <laughs> and it could be an article about confirmation hearings of what does this actually say and a challenge to the, to the next uh, confirmation hearing. Uh, if you don't do it, I might have to do it. Um, I pretty much adopt by reference almost everything Steve said, uh, except maybe for why I talk about Gideon and, and Reed and all those cases. I'll say, it, maybe, this is, maybe this is wrong, and if it's not wrong, maybe it's just unclear. But there's some sense, there's some set of cases where people have this like, oh, come on, we all know what was going on in those cases, even if they didn't say it. Some sense that they have like a communicative content that's not quite on the face of the opinion. So this is an effort, or a, maybe a misguided uh, uh, attempt to, to briefly indulge that game and see what, what comes from it. Uh, but again, maybe, maybe to no end. Uh, Larry, thank you for all of that. I guess I, I, I think about the theoretical disagreement thing as a sort of, I think my answer is, we can have theoretical disagreements at some levels of abstraction while we have agreements at higher levels of abstraction. And then the question is, is there an agreement at a high level of abstraction and does it get us anything? I try to do that without ever talking about the phrase theoretical disagreement because I don't want to sort of set up a, a bat signal for all of the like heart to work in debates. But that, that may ultimately be a mistake and it may be that I should just sort of go there, go there more, uh, more fully. Uh, I think that there, 
I wonder, you know, there's a part of this that could be a paper is really sort of like, what kind of pluralism do we have, right? It's obvious there are a bunch of different things people do. And the question is, is it unordered? Is it sometimes one method can trump another for external reasons? Or is there some you know, set of internal criteria that control the pluralism? Uh, and maybe that should be a bigger sort of continuing thread in the paper. Uh, thank you all. Let me very quickly respond to Randy. I mean, I think the, the bottom line is that you and I are not hardians, right? The foundational rule right, can be defined in two ways. Either it's defined by consensus, which is the Hardian view, or it's defined in some other way, which is the Dworkinian view. If the foundational rule is defined by consensus among officials, that means that dissent to a foundational cl claim is self-validating. That means that some group of officials can say, that's not foundational, and that becomes right just because they say that. Dworkin's point is that that can't be true, right? That is, people argue about foundational matters, and they can be wrong about that. But all that shows is that hard is wrong. On the Hardy account, the foundational rule is defined just by consensus. And if one, you know, and so, I mean, so maybe a lesson is we got to be natural lawyers, right? But that's another paper. Well, thanks very much, and, uh, and apologies to those who couldn't ask their questions. <laughs>